our service today, and I just want to tell you that there are only uh, two ways in, in, in the world. There is the way of being led by the Holy Spirit that lives within believers, and there is the way of being led by the Spirit of the world. And there is the Spirit of the world, and you see today in churches and even entire movements where Christians are actually being led by the world. They are, they are focused on worldly concepts, and they don't talk about sin, they talk about being very inclusive, they talk about political issues, racial issues, and they, they don't really, they're not led by the Spirit of God, and we want to be led by the Spirit of God. And that even goes into all areas of our lives. And all that is really a humble submission to the leading of the Holy Spirit. And that's really what we're talking about today, is being led by the Holy Spirit and what that looks like and what it looks like to be a true disciple of Jesus. Because there are, there are many out there who even claim to be Christians, but they aren't really led by the Spirit of God. They're really led by themselves. And so we have to be very cautious because we want to yield to the leading of the Holy Spirit and, and sense that conviction and then respond in the right way. And sometimes I think we as Christians, we sense the conviction of the Holy Spirit and we don't listen. We fight against it because we, we, we've been taught other theology, we've been taught other doctrines, and we, we go with man-made doctrines instead of being led humbly by the Spirit of God. So if you feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit, obey it. Just humbly obey it. I think it's a pride issue. We, we don't really obey it because we're proud and we think, no, I know better than the leading of the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit is, is going to show us what's in the scriptures. Maybe even things we didn't realize were in the scriptures. And then we realize, oh, that's in there. Maybe I need to adjust my thinking. Maybe I need to adjust how I see God. Because you can very easily have a false uh, conception of who Jesus is if you just cherry pick certain verses. And, you, and you, pretty soon you're left with this Jesus who doesn't resemble the real one. <laughs> you're left with a false Christ. So the real Jesus is more complex than just be nice to people. The real Jesus had some hard words to say about sin and righteousness. And that's the real Messiah. We want to avoid that, that false one that claims, you know, j j just be nice to everybody. D don't make waves. That's not, Jesus didn't teach that. But sometimes, that's why we've got to be in the Word so diligently and just really incorporate those harder Bible verses into our worldview of who Christ is. And that, friends, is going to be being led by the Spirit of God. And we are the family of God, so we are led by the Spirit of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are your people, and we right now want to be led by the Holy Spirit. So God, we submit to you. We deflate ourselves. We totally just reverentially bow down to you, God, in praise and submit to you in all of our ways. And then, God, you make our way straight. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. So, we are what you might call the body of Christ. We are the representative body on the earth of Jesus and his work in the world. That's, that's a big deal. That's important. That's beautiful. It's a cool thing. And I think uh, we, we need to emphasize this, that we are this unique body of believers that all have different giftings. We all have a different gift. We all have various different gifts that we can use in unique ways to impact people for Christ. My gifting is not the same as Shannon's gifting. My gifting is not the same as Lenore or Bruce's gifting. We all have different gifts. We want to use them to spread the gospel and to help people in need. And that's our goal as, as believers. And we want to obey the leading of God in all that. To, to, to do what Jesus says because then Jesus says, you're my family then. You're really my family if you do what I ask you to do. And that's what we're talking about today. You might say family, fellowship, uh, being brothers and sisters together. And if you are born again a second time, if you, if you are a new creature right now, a new being, with the sacred spirit living within you, and it's really real, then you are closer to me than my own flesh and blood family. We are family then by the spirit of God. 
the amazing thing. In this peculiar family, the family of God, we do not necessarily choose him, but he chose us. We know that's particularly true for his 12 disciples, the apostles. We see in Mark chapter 3, Jesus gathering the 12. Here's what happens. It says, Jesus went up on a mountainside and called to him those he wanted, and they came to him. He appointed 12 that they might be with him, and that he might send them out to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. These are the 12 appointed. Simon, to whom the, he gave the name Peter, John, or James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. To them he gave the name Bonagerys, which means sons of thunder. Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. These 12 men are appointed at this moment in history to the service of God. They are appointed as leaders. And guess what, brothers and sisters? The same thing happens in the Salvation Army in a similar way. It's not exactly the same thing. This is very important, right? But every year in the Salvation Army at commissioning, we have a commissioning event. Each year, new lieutenants are given their appointment. And they're brought on stage in front of 500 people and many more on live stream. And the, the commissioner pulls out his card and said, your first assignment in the Salvation Army is this core. And if you were to go, go back in the video to 2019, you would see me up there on stage saluting the commissioner. And, and the commissioner saying, Lieutenant Justin, you are going to the Owasso, Michigan Salvation Army. And I jumped with joy because I got my first appointment. And I was so excited. I bet... They were so excited to be appointed for God's mission. And many of you here have been appointed as well as soldiers and adherents and church members. And you've as well been appointed to a mission to serve. And that was exciting, wasn't it? I was excited for you. All these uh, the, then leaders and soldiers are now fighting members of the body of Christ around the Midwest of our area of the United States. Our territory is called the Central USA Territory. And we all begin to then serve in the kingdom of God. We are part of that. We're part of the body of believers worldwide. The Salvation Army is. We are. So then the goal is the body of Christ is active in small cities like Owasso, in medium cities, big cities like Flint and Detroit, Grand Rapids, different counties across the country and across the entire state of Michigan, all 50 states, and even further to 130 countries. And we're part then of the body of Christ, but so are other churches in our area. You know, in this area, there's about 40 churches in the Owasso area, and they're all part of our mission, our team. We all, as much as we're able, want to work together. We do have differences and we work separately for the most part. We also want to unite together uh, for uh, common uh, causes. And that's why we're going to get together, like I told you, on May 4th for the National Day of Prayer event. That's a great way to unite with fellow Christians. And then the goal is then uh, to bring about the ends of God. What, what is God calling us to do? Figure that out and then to do it. And then we spread the gospel and help people. And that's the message. But I want you to notice uh, something. All the Christians in the body of Christ, in this city and worldwide, if they are genuine believers, they have been given authority. And you as well have kingdom authority. Notice three things in that Mark chapter 3, particularly in 14 and 15, that it said he, is, he was with them. First. Second, that they would preach the gospel. And third, that they were given authority to drive out demons. So that's kingdom authority to preach, that authority to have Christ with them, and authority to drive out demons. That's authority. That is spiritual authority. They are given permission by Jesus to have the spirit within them, to share the message with their mouth, and to speak in Jesus' name to command demons to come out of people. 
You have that same kingdom authority today, brothers and sisters. You are a kingdom representative on earth. That is your authority. And walk in that authority. Realize the authority you have as a kingdom agent. The world shifts around you as a kingdom agent in Christ. Not because of you, but because of who's living in you. Jesus Christ. You have that authority. And I want you to start thinking about that as you live your life. You are a kingdom representative of the kingdom of God. There's a, there's a ministry that I like uh, called The Truth Project. And he has a, a little plaque uh, on his desk, I believe it is, or on his wall that says, Embassy of the Kingdom of God. That he is, a, he is an, an, an ambassador uh, for the kingdom of God, for God's kingdom. And he takes that seriously, and I think we should too. You can make a massive difference in Jesus' name. I think one of the deadliest tricks of the enemy is try to, try to steal our authority, try to make us think that we can't make a difference, try to make us feel swept along by events in the world. And that is not the case, brothers and sisters. We have authority, and we can have hope and joy and courage to make a difference. We can make a difference. We already have, frankly. We already have in this community made a difference that will last. But we want to make more of a difference now, too. And you have authority to do that. Don't let the enemy steal that authority. You have it. It's yours. It is your inheritance as being part of the kingdom of God. It belongs to you. Don't let anyone steal it or lie to you that it's not there. Believe that you have that kingdom authority because, guess what? It's true. You can believe it because it's true. Don't let the enemy steal it. You're in. Don't let the enemy make you think this stupid line, I'm a victim. No. You are not a victim. No, no, no. Not a victim. No. I. The, the reason I get upset is because the enemy says that garbage to me. You're a victim, you, oh, you're always sick, you know, you're always, no, oh, you can't possibly do this, it doesn't, it'll, it'll never work, blah, blah, blah. Don't let the enemy lie to you, you're not a victim, I'm not a victim, you're a hero, you're a hero. And as you live for Christ, the world is changing because people's lives are being reshaped by the message you bring. Believe and be courageous. And you'll see that, you have to be patient though, it takes time. But be patient in the battling, and you will see victories. All authority, the Bible says, in heaven and on earth belong to Jesus Christ, your Savior. And we know that Jesus shares that authority in his name with us. And that's amazing. We are the house of representatives, you could say, of the body of Christ on earth. There you see the U.S. House. And I want you to think of it in this way. Because when Christians unite and pray and love one another deeply from the heart and stand united, that unity is powerful. It changes the world. Just like if you have a unity in the, in the House of Representatives, if you have the, the, the all, all the reps or most of the reps on your side, it's going to pass. But whatever you're working on is going to pass. But if you're divided, it's not going to pass. So I'll give you one example then. Basically every believer, do you remember when the, the war in Ukraine started, that Russia invaded Ukraine? And it was all over the news, and people became galvanized and united. I mean, Republicans, Democrats, Libertarians, Socialists, Christians, non-Christians, I mean, Catholics, Lutherans, everyone uh, became united in this idea that what was happening there was wrong. And Christians of every denomination, I mean every denomination, from super conservative to super liberal, uh, we're all standing in prayer, united and praying over the Ukraine conflict. And what happened? It should have been super easy for Russia to invade Ukraine. I mean, so easy. I mean, Russia should have ran over Ukraine in about six months. 
they still have a public way testifying about it as well. This could connect closely with teachers and leaders uh, because Jesus calls out the religious leaders for blaspheming the Holy Spirit. Apparently something about this sin of publicly condemning the Spirit can harden someone to the point they can never and will never repent. That's, that's the most I could figure out was like, there's something about condemning the work of the Holy Spirit uh, that can harden your heart to the point that it can, it can never be softened again. It's really interesting. So that, that, that'd be blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Some have connected the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit then uh, with, with the, the mention in the scriptures, the unforgivable sin. But I honestly don't think they're connected. You ever heard of the unforgivable sin, that there's a sin that can't be forgiven? It's mentioned in the scriptures in certain places in 1 John, I believe. Um, but I, I looked into it in the same word. Like, if they were connected, you would think that in the places where the unforgivable sin was mentioned, it would use that same blasphemy word in the Greek or Hebrew, but it doesn't. So that's why I tend to think they're not connected. But maybe there is at least one slight connection there, because I was looking into the unforgivable sin, and I thought, okay, here's one area where it mentions um, some, someone basically not being able to repent after having sinned in some way. It says this in Hebrews 10, 26 through 30. I know we're getting deep here for a minute, but let's just dive in a little bit, then we'll move on. It says, if we deliberately keep on sinning after we, after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sins is left. So at, at, at that point, it say, say there's, there's no way to be forgiven at that point. Where someone is deliberately keeping on sinning after they receive knowledge of the truth. But only a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Anyone who rejected the law of Moses died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much more severely do you think someone deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot? Who has treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified them and who has insulted the spirit of grace? Now, that word insulted there is not the same word as blasphemy. So that's why I think there's not much of a connection between the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit and the unforgivable sin. The blasphemy of the Holy Spirit seems, seems to be something to do with the hardening of the heart as far as I can tell. But I think there's more to, to it than that. But for the unforgivable sin, it has more to do with apostasy of of continuing to sin while being a Christian, of making a practice of sinning in a, in a severe way. It says then, to finish in verse 30, For we know him who said, It is mine to avenge, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So you see that idea of then trampling the Son of God underfoot in, in, in Hebrews here. And then, like I said, it kind of disconnects it from the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit to be something a little different. Uh, because the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is unforgivable, while Jesus says those who blaspheme against him can be forgiven. That's really interesting. So Jesus says that anyone can be forgiven who may insult Jesus himself. That's a great thing to insult the Son of God. That person can be forgiven, but someone who insults the Spirit of grace, that's an eternal sin. Interesting. There's, there's something deeper here that I think I'm not seeing, but it's interesting. And I'd encourage you to do more research on this. In any case, so there you have it. And he, here's one of those harder scriptures. You don't see this one uh, on the most searched results on BibleGateway.com. This is not a scripture that you see... Uh, you know, tattooed on a football player or on someone's shoulder. You, you don't see this one um, on, a, on a card for someone's birthday, you know, or recited at a wedding. And so we tend to forget about it, but this is just as much the Word of God as the rest of the Bible. And yeah, it's a hard statement, isn't it? For those who make a, a practice of sinning habitually, no sacrifice for sins is left. That's kind of scary. But it's part of the Word of God, and I need to embrace this as part of God's character, and it's good. It's good that God commands us not to keep sinning habitually. Because sin hurts people, and it hurts us. 
So embracing these harder scriptures that are just as true as John 3.16 or Romans 8.28 or Jeremiah 29.11. Okay? All right. In any case, Jesus says to the Pharisees that they are blaspheming the Spirit and they are eternally lost. Um, like I said, how this works is a mystery, but I think all of us here today say, Lord, may it never be so of us. Uh, may we always declare that your Spirit is holy, holy, holy. And give glory to Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. Amen? Amen. Amen. Next, we see again an issue with his family. I assume they must have come uh, right when he got there at this table. Then they left again. Now they're back. But they can't get to him because so many people have gathered. But they sent word for him. It says uh, in Mark 3, 31-35, then Jesus' mother and brothers arrived. Standing outside, they sent someone uh, to call him in. The crowd was sitting around him, and they told him, Your mother and brothers are outside looking for you. Who are my mother and my brothers, he asked. Then he looked at those seated in a circle around him and said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. Here we find, I think, the key to the entire chapter. It's all about family, being a disciple of Jesus. And we've seen how various different groups have responded to Christ in this chapter. His 12 disciples followed him faithfully, aside from Judas. There's one exception in that group. Two, his blood relatives disbelieved in him at first, but later on, they all become followers of Jesus later, so be aware of that. Three, the crowds of people listening to him, they are uh, just coming to him and listening to him, to him, but many of these people are divided and some believe and some don't. And then the religious leaders reject him, but it says later in the Gospel of John that many of the Pharisees did believe in Jesus in, in the end. And all of this comes down to the final question question. Who of these groups, of all these people, is the real family of Jesus? Is it a religious Pharisee because they're so good at the law of Moses? Not necessarily, no, but the, the, the gospel is open to them. Is it the crowds because they listen to him? Not necessarily, though many do believe in the crowds. Is it his blood relatives because they are related to him by blood and very close to him? Not necessarily, though many do believe in him later. Was it his 12 disciples? Not necessarily, because one of them would betray him. So how do we really know who Jesus' body is on the earth? It is evidenced by this simple fact. They do the will of God. They do the will of God. They practically live for Jesus. They obey God in their daily lives. That is the evidence. That is who is family to Jesus. You claim to be a Christian in this room? Okay, let's test it. Do you obey the will of God in your life? Do you? Because Jesus said in Matthew 7, 21 through 23, Not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. On judgment day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name and performed many miracles in your name, but I will reply, I never knew you. Get away from me, you who break God's laws. And in conclusion today, we see two factors there, a positive and a negative command. First, we positively see that the true Christian does the will of the Father in heaven on a daily basis. Right? He says, only those who do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. So they positively do what God is asking them to do. Secondly, we see a negative statement that uh, these people who were not of God broke God's laws. They practiced lawlessness. They made a practice of, you might say, habitually sinning, like we talked about in Hebrews 10. They made a practice of habitually sinning. 
So we want to make sure we are turning away from sin. That's why I always tell you, if you get caught up in a sin, repent quickly. Just And take it right to the Father. Take it right to God and say, Lord, I messed up. Please forgive me, Jesus. You just take it to him in prayer. I repent before you now, God, and you're, you're good to go. You, then you move in the new direction. And set, set up, if it's, a, if it's a habitual sin, set up some plans to get free. Whether it's seeing a counselor or maybe finding a Christian workbook or meeting with me, your pastor, or meeting with another Christian. You take some action steps to make sure it doesn't happen again. That was with me, like with alcohol, like with drugs and smoking. I had to take action steps to be free of those things. But God was with me, and he loved me through all of it and helped me. But he, he does want us to take those action steps toward freedom. Yeah, that's good then. Now, I'm speaking now in conclusion to two groups here. This is for our response time. Group one. Group one. Ask the Holy Spirit to help you really do God's will and put sin to death. Those are the two things. Positively doing God's will and negatively putting sins to death. There's the balance. Because I want to stir you up. In, which group are you in? First group, I want to stir you up and inspire a bit of a holy fear so that you will take your faith walk a little more seriously and really live for Jesus. That's group one. For some of you, group two... You are already living for Jesus. And so I'm trying to make sure you, you, you don't start condemning yourself right now or feeling mad anxiety about this issue. Okay? Gr group one is for you people who are, are not quite there. I want to challenge you right now to, to ask God in prayer right now to help you do two things. Do God's will and put sin to death. Second group, I want you to ask the Holy Spirit to grant you grace your joy, peace, and success in doing his will. Group two is for people who are already all in for Jesus and living it daily. I want you then to ask God for peace and joy in it. Okay? We are the body of Christ today. We are each members of it. And we all have these giftings then. And that's really what, when we talk about doing God's will, that's using those gifts. We talked about this at Life Group this last Tuesday. What are your giftings? What are your giftings? These are the lists of spiritual gifts in the Bible. I want you to look at this list. So, complicated response time. But, first of all, I want you to think about those two groups that we talked about and pray about this. Part two is I want you to pray about your spiritual gifts and which you can use for the kingdom of God. Pray now and look at this list of spiritual gifts as you pray. And, and, and pray, God, which of these gifts do I have that I can use toward your kingdom? Is it serving? Is it administration? Is it preaching? Is it exhortation? Is it prophecy? Is it showing mercy? Is it... Is it uh, discernment? Is it healing? Is it miracles? Is it uh, evangelism? Is it pastoring? Is it service? Is it mercy? Is it giving? Is it encouragement? That's a good one. Uh, let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, during our response time, we just pray, God, that you would reveal to us, Lord, and Holy Spirit, and Jesus, and Father, that you would reveal to each person in this room uh, the, the spiritual gifts that you have for us. And help us to apply them and put them to work in our lives, God, please. And also, God, we pray that you would uh, help us here to live your will and to put sin to death as well, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. During our response time, I want to invite you to come forward to our altars and pray. Or pray at your seats and ask God about being led by the Holy Spirit.